Now turn to section 1. Section 1. You will hear a man phoning to inquire about hotel information. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Good afternoon. You're through to reception at the Island Hotel in Crete. How may I help you today? Yes, hello there. I'm hoping to book a double room for my wife and myself for about two weeks from the 25th of April of this year. Firstly, could you tell me whether it's particularly hot during this time? Yes, of course, sir. During late April and early May, the daytime temperature shouldn't exceed 19 degrees Celsius. But the weather has been rather erratic and difficult to predict in recent years, so I am unable to say for certain. OK, that sounds good. My wife doesn't like going outside when it's very hot. I haven't booked flights yet but I must say that I'm unfamiliar with Crete and its transport system. Does the hotel provide an airport shuttle service? Yes, sir. We provide a complimentary airport pickup service for all our guests. It takes about 40 minutes to get here from the airport, but it's at least 60 minutes at rush hours, and you will be provided with a fully air-conditioned shuttle bus. OK, excellent. In that case, do you have any rooms available for the dates I gave you? I shall have a look on the system now for you, sir. Bear with me just a moment. Yes, sir. I can see now that we have several rooms available. Would you prefer a garden view or a sea view? Well, ideally, I would like a sea view room with a balcony. But, of course, that depends on the difference in price. Not to worry, sir. All of our standard double rooms have ensuite facilities and a balcony. If you would like one of our sea view rooms, there is a premium of 60 euros per night. OK. So could you tell me the total nightly rate for a standard double room with a sea view? Yes, of course, sir. For the spring months, our rate is 216 euros per night. For 14 nights altogether, this will come to 3,024 euros. Perfect. I also read on your website that the hotel has gym and spa facilities. Are there any other facilities on offer? Yes, we have a large outdoor infinity pool overlooking the ocean with luxury sunbeds and a poolside bar. We also have three full-size tennis courts where we run a popular doubles tournament with the winner receiving two all-inclusive spa day vouchers. Goodness, I shall have to brush up on my tennis skills. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Are there any other activities organised by the hotel that we can partake in? It's just that it's our wedding anniversary on the 30th of June, and I would like to provide my wife with a perfect romantic getaway. I can assure you, sir, that your wife won't be disappointed. Ours is a five-star resort, which is renowned for its luxury and beauty. In terms of activities, the hotel provides thrice-weekly entertainment. On Tuesdays, guests will take a minibus and partake in learning to cook succulent fish dishes 
with our Michelin-starred chef Enrique. The class will take place in a beautiful valley deep in the Cretan hills, where guests will be treated to an intimate piano performance by our in-house concert pianist Pedro. On Wednesdays, a select number of guests will be fortunate enough to explore the mountains by helicopter before being transported to a tropical Cretan garden by shuttle bus. Finally, on Thursdays, after a fancy dinner, we provide a spectacular fireworks display, which guests can view from the comfort of a cable car. Oh wow, that all sounds absolutely wonderful. I shall book the room now, and then I need to look at flights so as not to become extortionate. Would you like to take my details now or later? That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You will hear part of a radio program about online exchange business. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Barter Online UK is a young up-and-coming website in the United Kingdom where users can buy new and used goods. However, instead of paying with money, registered users instead exchange their purchase for an item of similar value. This part is perhaps the most complicated as the registered users themselves must mutually decide on an appropriate value, with value either being the recommended retail price, RRP, or simply how much they believe the item to be worth. The website has been founded by a group of four friends in the north of England. Originally, they exchanged their belongings among family members. They frequently found themselves swapping their belongings when they no longer had any use for them. They live by the motto, one person's trash is another person's treasure, and hate to throw things away. As more and more people caught wind of the idea and wanted to participate in the exchanges, the group decided that the idea had the potential to become a successful business venture, and so it did. Barter Online UK is a startup online business which took three months to set up and has now been running for around half a year. Despite only being founded a short time ago, the website has already garnered about 1,500 registered users, with 500 more than expected, a huge achievement for the founders. Some of the users are registered in the United Kingdom and Canada, with the majority from the Republic of Ireland. In order to become a registered member, users must first fill in their personal details, followed by their credit or debit card details, which will be used to take payment of a monthly fee of £5. As long as this fee is paid, users will be able to perform an unlimited number of online exchanges. Before you hear the rest of the programme, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. A multitude of items are sold on the website, such as textbooks, soft toys and tools. However, books for children and computer games are by far selected most. The exchange process itself is not as complicated as it might seem. Users can enter their preferences for what they would like to receive and also explicitly state what they would like to give away and the website will automatically pair up suitable users. If, however, a user doesn't want to give anything away but would simply like to buy something, Barter Online UK does support a secure online payment system where users can perform a normal monetary transaction. Despite this, the founding group strongly discourages the use of the online payment system, clearly stating that this goes against the intended ethos of the company. Although bartering is an age-old process, many of the website's users are unsure how to decide which of their own items to exchange. It often helps to order items by popularity using the filter button provided. This will tell the website to find out popular items for users' convenience. To this, the founding members say, just put everything you don't want on there. Different people have different tastes, and you never know what they might be looking for. In order to aid registered users in their exchanges, and to provide them with assurance, the founders recently added a new feature, whereby on completion of an exchange, users will be encouraged to provide each other with feedback. This feedback will include criteria such as the quality of the item as compared with how it was advertised, the ease of communication with the seller, the speed at which the item was delivered, and so on. The friends believe that using this method, users will have a more transparent and trustworthy bartering experience. That is the end of section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3. You will hear two medical students, Caitlin and Hideki, discussing options for courses. First you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 23. Hi, Hideki. How are you? Fine. I'm glad I bumped into you. Have you got five minutes to sit down and discuss our extra course options for next term? Yes, yeah, sure. You mean the support courses for our modules? Yes. We've got three choices, and I'm not sure which would be best for us to do. Let's have a look. Um... Yeah, we could do science and ethics. Sounds quite interesting. Yes, but I think we should be thinking what we get out of each course. Mm. So, science and ethics. There's a lot of reading and research to do. And I don't think it comes up in the exams, does it? Um, I'm not sure. Uh... Oh, I see we have to do assignments and we get our score from that. But what it would do is to force us to get better at doing essays and reports, you know, organizing them and using the right kind of language. Mm. It might be worthwhile. Yeah, you're right. An alternative is the pharmacology prelim course. Oh. I think it's in case we want to go on to transfer to pharmacology at the end of the year, because lots of students do. Mm -hmm. 
so it depends what we want to do in the future. But apparently, they send you off to find out about various companies and the differences between their products. It would give you lots of practice in investigative studies and analysis. I think I'd quite enjoy that. Yes, I see your point. Um, then the other option is reporting test results. Sounds a bit boring. Not sure why they have a separate course just for that. Well, I could certainly do with some help in that. Because if you go out into industry, that's what you'll spend most of your time doing. Mm. So it's got a very practical application. Mm -hmm. I think I'm going to go for pharmacology. Me too. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 24 to 30. Now listen carefully and answer questions 24 to 30. So, let's have a look at it in more detail. Oh, goodness. If we do pharmacology, then we have to do a supplementary maths course. Oh, no, that's not fair. Mm. Mind you, I think I need it. <laughs> Does that mean we have twice as many lectures? No. This maths is only a short course. The chemistry department are responsible, and they do it in the third term. So we've got all next term to settle into the pharmacology bit. Oh, I find the tutor makes a real difference. Some of them make chemistry so easy, and some of them I can't understand at all. Like that one we had from Oxford University. Oh. <laughs> Mind you, the one on this course should make sense because he's a lecturer who's coming in for a few weeks from industry. So at least it'll be linked to the real world. <laughs> yeah. The project we have to do on this pharmacology course is huge and it doesn't give us much time. We have to make a decision about what we want to do on the project as soon as we start in January and then hand in our plans before the end of the month. Doesn't give us much time to sort out what's possible or not. Mm. I mean, doesn't the scale of our project depend on what resources we can have? Like, what equipment we can use? I suppose so, though I think there's plenty available. For example, it says that if we need to do any experiments, then we can use all the equipment in the new lab, as long as we book it. Oh, OK. It's slowly beginning to take shape for me. I think it'll be a good course. I'm just worried that I get enough support to do it. Huh. I think you'll be OK. And the tutors are always available if you get stuck. Oh, actually, it says that if you're not sure, then in December, they'll be running one or two additional seminars. So I might go to those. Actually, What's quite interesting is that at the end of the course, when our project is completed, then we have to do a presentation on it. Oh. I think that's quite good practice. Oh, a bit scary, though. <laughs> well, it shouldn't be too bad, as they say that we can do it in pairs. Oh. Spread the load, as it were. <laughs> oh, good. I have done presentations before, but I'm always very nervous. And is the presentation what we're assessed on, then? Let me look. Um, ah, it says that we have an interview and we get a mark for the whole course, depending on how well we do in that. Oh, right. OK. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 4. 
you will hear Rebecca Bramwell, an artist and illustrator, giving advice on how to get your first job or commission as an artist. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 35. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 35. I'd like to introduce Rebecca Bramwell, an artist and illustrator who has come along today to talk to you all about getting your first job or commission as an artist. Over to you, Rebecca. Thank you for inviting me. I remember when I graduated back in 1983, I was very excited about getting my first commission. My degree was in fine art and I'd worked long and hard to get it. I was an enthusiastic student and I never found it difficult to find the incentive to paint. I think as a student you're pushed along by fellow students and tutors and the driving force is there. However, when you leave college, you find yourself saying things like, I'll have one more cup of coffee and then I'll sit down to work. <laughs> I hate to admit it, but I say it myself. Suddenly, it isn't finding the inspiration or getting the right paper that's a problem. It's you. In my view, there are a number of reasons why this happens. It's a real challenge making a decent living as a new artist. You have to find a market for your work. Often you work freelance and need to take samples or portfolios of your work from place to place. These experiences are common to a lot of professional people. But artists also have to bear their souls to the world, in a way. More than anything, they want praise. If people don't like what they create, then it can be a very emotional and upsetting experience hearing them say this. I began to realise that these problems were preventing me from having a career in art, and so I decided to experiment. I was a painter, but I started to dabble in illustration, drawing pictures for books, cards, and this offered me the opportunity to become more emotionally detached from my work. I was no longer producing images from the heart, but developing images for a specified subject, taking a more practical approach. I began to develop a collection of my illustrations, which I put into a portfolio and started to carry around with me to show prospective clients and employers. But it was still tricky because publishers, for example, want to know that your drawings will reproduce well in a book. But without having had any work published, it's hard to prove this. Having a wonderful portfolio or a collection of original artwork is, of course, a first step. But what most potential clients would like to see is printed artwork. And without this evidence, they tend to hold back still when it comes to offering a contract. Look at questions 36 to 40. Now answer questions 36 to 40. Well, I overcame this problem in two ways. <clears throat> and I, I suppose this is my advice to you on preparing your portfolio of your best work. The first way was by submitting my work for a competition. And the one I chose was for a horoscope design and was sponsored by a top women's magazine. 
There are a few of these competitions each year, and they offer new illustrators an opportunity to showcase their work. The other approach I took was to design and print some mock-up pages of a book. In other words, I placed some of my illustrations next to some text in order to demonstrate how my work would look when it was printed. <laughs> Perhaps I was lucky in that I, I had taken a degree that provided me with all-round creative skills so that I could vary my style and wasn't limited to a certain technique. Now, I think that is important. The art world and many other creative fields do try to pigeonhole people into snug boxes with an accompanying label. Now, I think you should try to resist this if you feel it happening to you. If you don't, you'll find it difficult to have new work accepted if you try to develop your style at a later stage in your career. Nevertheless, when you start out, and particularly when you're going for an interview, it's important not to confuse people by having a lot of different examples in your portfolio. One remedy for this is to separate your work into distinct categories. In my case, I did this by dividing my design-inspired illustrations from my paintings. It's then easier to analyse the market suited to each portfolio, such as magazines, book jackets, CD covers, etc. Working under two names is also useful, as it clarifies the different approaches and offers a distinction between them. I think it's been hard for artists to be recognised in anything other than the pigeonholes that they've been placed in. But luckily, these barriers are slowly being demolished. So I really do wish you all the very... That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.